Welcome to the show today. I'm so glad you have joined me, me today. Ah, it's been a little while, but I'm so glad that you decided to take time out of your busy day to join us to read a little bit and to talk a little bit about Christian figures uh, of the faith in history, who we a lot of times have been forgotten to time. But we want to talk a little bit about them because they are important figures and they lend themselves to what we believe today, some of them, and they were great spokesmen, so we just want to talk about them today. Now, um, today, uh, we are dealing with a, a an African-American uh, theologian. His name is James W.C. Uh, Pennington. How many have heard of him? He was a great a figure of the past, an abolitionist, a pastor, a writer, a spokesman, so much about him, and we just want to talk about him today. So let's get into let's get into it and talk about James W. C. Pennington. James W. C. Pennington was an abolitionist, an educator, historian, and minister. Pennington was born enslaved on Maryland's eastern shore and named James Pembroke in January 1807. He escaped from slavery in 1827 and changed his name to Pennington. He was illiterate when he escaped. In 1828, Pennington moved to New York where he worked as a blacksmith. He joined the campaign against slavery and during this period became friends with William Lloyd Garrison and Louis Tappan. He continued with his education and worked as a school teacher in Newton, Long Island before becoming a pastor of Temple Street Congregational Church. Pennington taught himself to read and write and was proficient in Greek and Latin by the early 1830s. He moved to New Haven, Connecticut in the mid-1830s to pursue theological studies. Because he was black, Yale's School of Divinity refused to enroll him as a regular student. However, they did allow him to attend lectures, but he could not participate in classes or borrow books from the library. Pennington successfully completed his training and received his ordination in 1838. In 1839, Pennington joined with Louis Tappan in organizing help for his fellow Africans who had been arrested as a result of the Amistad mutiny. He published a textbook of the origin of history of the colored people in 1841, in which he argued against European claims of superiority and established the African origins of Western European civilization. In 1849, the University of Heidelberg in Germany awarded him an honorary doctorate of divinity degree in 1849, the first African-American to be awarded an, ordinary, an honorary degree by a European university, and next year he published his autobiography, The Fugitive Blacksmith. Pennington had become a leading figure in the United States by 1853, and that year was elected president of the National Free Colored People's Convention. Pennington advocated for black support and enlistment in the Union Army during the Civil War. After the war, he broke from the Presbyterians because of their reluctance to get involved with uplift efforts for freed blacks. When the war was over, he served for a short time as a minister in Mississippi. Next, he was called to Portland, Maine, where he served for three years. Early in 1870, he returned to the South, where he had been appointed by the Presbyterian Church to serve in Florida, where he organized an African-American congregation in Jacksonville, Florida. He died there on October 22, 1870, after a short illness. You know, it's something to have purpose in life. So the road might be road, uh, hard sometimes, and it might not be easy to fulfill our purpose. But you know what? There is a peace in it. There is a, uh, a fulfillment in it. And 
Don't you desire to fulfill your purpose in life? Just like these great theologians, these great pastors, these great persons of faith did that they left this world empty. They were filled up. God filled them up with purpose, filled them up with giftings, and then they fulfilled their purpose through the through their lives and through their work, and they um, left this life empty. Now, I don't know about you, but when I leave this earth, I want to leave empty. And that's why, partly why, you know, I come on, amen, to to talk about what I believe uh, the Lord is saying to people today. So I want to encourage you, if there is something burning in your heart, to go forward. It might not be perfect, and people might not always understand uh, your purpose in life. But thank God you're not a cookie cutter of what everybody else is doing. Amen. A lot of people are doing different things and we follow after people, but that doesn't mean that that's our purpose in life. What a joy it is to fulfill the purpose in life that God has given you and me. So let's uh, set our minds, whatever years we have left, or maybe we've wasted some years and we haven't always done the things that we should have done. But at this point, right now, we can set our, 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 our path upon doing exactly what God is calling us to do, just like uh, our brother Pennington. So let's talk about his theology. You know, that comes into play uh, when we're fulfilling our purpose. What is our theology? What exactly do we believe about God? What do we believe? You know, we go to different churches, there's different denominations. What do you believe about God, about his, about what he's saying in the earth, about creation, about faith, the Holy Spirit's work and activity in man today. What is your position? You know, we get preached to and then, uh, or we get preached or to, or we go to services and so on. But what is it that you believe? Do you come with a preconceived idea of what God is? Has God spoken to you about who he is to you? Um, we need to know those things and uh, uh, allow God to speak to us on that vein. Um, Pennington was a person who knew who he was in God. Though he was born a slave, um, though he was in slavery, a slavery time, a time when people were saying that he wasn't a full man. He knew that God was calling him to greater. He knew that despite everything, that God was calling him to do a certain work. So let's talk about the theology of Mr. Pennington. For 32 years, Pennington labored as a preacher. We're reading from his biography um, as a preacher. During those years, slavery was a dominant theme of his published sermons, for many of his parishioners were former slaves. Most of these formal public utterances were not preserved, but those that are extant provide valuable assistance in understanding his role in the African American church and community. Systemic organization was a prominent characteristic of the sermons he delivered. They follow a pattern of exegesis, exposition, and, ap and application. So uh, the theme of the farewell sermon preached to his Hartford congregation in 1845 was the apostolic commendation, its meaning and application. Stated differently, the theme was the cultivation of individual apostleship in the context of the believing community. It was based on Acts 20, 32, where Paul was leaving his congregation at Miletus and going to Jerusalem. Pennington showed the meaning of each phrase in the passage by exegeting and explicating each phrase. For example, and now, brethren, I commend you to God, was explored first in Greek, and then it was related to Paul's departure for Rome. In the exposition, he emphasized the love of God. If one loved God, he would be obedient to him in the world. To each other, the members 
should be apostles guided by the love of Christ. One's love for, of Christ could be expressed in good works like passing the fugitive along and supporting the temperance cause. The sermon was delivered in pleading tone to engender congregational cooperation in the absence of its minister. Pennington followed the same pattern in his sermon on Christian zeal. It was based on John 2, 17, dealing with the need for zeal among the apostles. The exhortation was a discourse on the scripture nature of zeal and its practical power in the world. After defining Christian zeal as impassioned ardor in the cause of Christ, he explained that it had enabled Moses to prevail against Egypt, Israel's oppressor. Then he called on the third presbytery to build churches, not only among the rich, but also among the poor. He maintained that presbytery could also demonstrate its zeal by increasing its active opposition to slavery. In the sermon, Covenants Involving Moral Wrong, Pennington er argued that the clause of the United States Constitution requiring the return of runaway slaves was morally wrong and an agreement with hell. According to Pennington, in Isaiah 28, 8, a covenant with death or sin was wrong, and God would destroy the covenant. Likewise, the United States' agreement to return the fugitive was morally invalid, and God would destroy the clause. Isn't it interesting that in his sermon, he took the word, read the word, read, and took out of the word um, that slavery was wrong. The point here is that he took what was prevalent in his day and took the word to apply what God would be saying about what's happening in the world in his day. And so we can do the same thing today, apply the word to what's going on in society today. That's the application of the word. When the preacher is preaching, you're reading, okay, this happened back in Israel time or Hebrew time or what have you, but how does that word speak to me today? I need a rhema word today. How does that affect what I believe? How does that affect how I live? How does that affect how we treat other people? That's what the preacher does. He takes that word, reads it, and says, how does that apply to us today? What can we get from that? What is God saying to us today? People are looking for a word for a preacher to prophesy or so forth to them, but God's word is applicable today. We can find the answers to many of our problems and to many situations and to many of our questions by reading the word and applying the word to what uh is happening in our lives today. I like that. Did you realize also that Pennington was a person who knew Greek and Hebrew? He was a person who not only said, I am called to preach, but I have to actually study to show myself approved so that I can understand exactly what God is saying so that I can translate that to the people. Um, so many today. Uh, refuse to discipline themselves to the word, to studying of the word. Um, we can't get up and just say that we're called and then be an overnight wonder. No, this man studied the word. Matter of fact, he got an honor honorary doctorate. He had studied, but he also received an honorary doctorate in theology um, during his lifetime. Okay, so he was a person who knew how to apply the word, and not only just to apply the word, but then to have a zeal, he says, to have a zeal among the people. What does that mean? He had an excitement. It wasn't just something dry, something that he read about, and something dry. It was alive in him, and that zeal, that drive, that uh, life came through when he was speaking, that's what draws people. They say, hey, man, this guy is excited about what he believes. He has a passion for what he believes. 
he has a passion to spread it to others. We have to be passionate about uh, what we do. Have you ever seen somebody who's at work and they're just not passionate about their work? They're just kind of like, you know, to wait for retirement. Well, you know, we cannot be that way. God should always be. He's always filling us with excitement, always filling us with expectancy, always filling us with the zeal of God. And he wants us to walk in that. And that light that's in us, that's that light that shines through us, that light that shines in darkness. When that light shines through, it is compelling to men. Many people follow this man. Many people follow people because of their zeal. But we also have to have the word behind it. The word, the zeal plus the word. And that is what Mr. Pennington had. Um, this, uh, okay, in contrast, let's go on here. He's talking about, let's go to the section that talks about Pennington as a pastor. As an African-American pastor committed to implementing the gospel as he understood it, Pennington encountered at least two major problems. The first problem was one of economic support. As a minister in the Presbyterian denomination, he was not encouraged to assume secular employment to supplement his meager salary from poor congregation. During his tenure at Talcott Street and Shiloh, Pennington did work as a teacher in the African-American school attached to his church. Stop. <laughs> this man said, I'm not only going to preach the word, I'm not only going to, uh, not only am I called as a preacher, but my preaching right now is not able to support my family. So he found no harm in getting a secular job to support his family. Now, Many of us believe that once you're called, that's it. That's your whole life substance. But if your congregation cannot support uh, you monetarily, there is no harm in getting some kind of employment, some kind of uh, or using the work of your hands to support your family while you are uh, doing ministry. Paul did it. He was a tent maker. Jesus was a carpenter. I, I believe that they use these gifts. They use the working of their hand to support them, uh, their bodily needs, their family needs, and their spirit. And until they were able to uh, be supported, then they just did this. Or, or maybe they even just like to do the work of their hands. Some people love their job, and there's no harm in that. But don't be a burden upon congregations. He found it not, to, uh, not wise to be a burden to a congregation that could not support him. So he went and go ahead. He went and did a job. He went and found something that he could do with his hands. Brothers and sisters, it's the same today. We can, we can learn a lot from that, and we can do that as well attached to his church uh, for African-Americans to acquire basic education as a prelude to African-American independence. He saw the need for them to learn to be educated. For instance, most schools like the ones Pennington taught in had debating teams and oratorical societies as aids in sharpening the intellectual acumen for students. Such schools were not only objects of evangelization, but transmitters of culture. These African-American schools were forced to serve the double function to fill the gap created by white-controlled schools, which refused to admit African-American pupils. In addition to teaching, Pennington published some of his sermons and articles on timely subjects. He spoke on the issues of his day with the re re relevance of Christian perspective. It is important to note, nevertheless, that the basic inability of the churches he served, especially Shiloh, to remain economically independent destined such churches and their pastor to be dependent upon sympathetic and often paternalistic white supporters. While the amount of Pennington's yearly salary, nor the poor 
portion of it paid by white sources is available during the tenure of his first pastor, Samuel E. Cornish, the Presbytery of New York, had to assume financial responsibility for the church building. By the time Pennington became Shiloh's pastor, the church was economically solvent. The church became solvent, to able to support themselves, but probably continued to receive aid from the Presbytery. Another problem Pennington encountered was meeting the high education standards of the Presbyterian Church. The church liked for its ministers for, to be seminary graduates. A seminary grad degree, however, was not the norm even for white ministers. Many of them pursued their theological training under the supervision of an older minister because he had been both tutored and self-taught in addition to having at least audited courses at Yale. He went to Yale. Okay. Pennington was well educated by most standards of the day. Theodore S. Wright, whom he whom he succeeded at Shiloh was very exceptional. He was a Princeton Seminary graduate. Although he was not even a college graduate, graduate through study and determination, Pennington became an effective minister who valued education highly. Okay, he's saying that he didn't go, he, he was not educated on the level of some of his brethren, but he had a passion for the word and studied to become an effective minister. And he also valued the education of seminary. Okay, I'm going to, um, this little bit right here. While Pennington served six churches as pastor during his ministerial career, by far the most significant were Hartford's Talcott Street Congregational and Shiloh Presbyterian in New York City. He was a preacher in New York City. Wow. Pennington labored at Hartford's Talcott Church for seven years, following the pattern of African Americans in other denominations. This church started in 1819 when people of color worshiping at white churches and tiring of the custom of being assigned seats in the galleries began to worship by themselves. These pioneers assembled in the conference room of the First Church of Christ, white, under the leadership of Reverend Asa Goldsboro, an African-American preacher. Well, we might look at him a little bit, too, because I, I didn't realize that. Um, pursuant to the wishes of this group of worshipers, the managers of Hartford Sunday School Union met in eight, April 1820 and established a Sunday school exclusively for the people of color. Six years later, the African Religious Society, the name assumed by the fledgling group, was incorporated and in 1833 was recognized at Church of Christ. And it goes on to talk about his, um, his uh, 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 work, his church work in the Presbyterian Church and throughout his life. He was someone uh, who was, uh, I would say he was a determined person a person of purpose and who uh, knew who he was in Christ, who he was as an ambassador of Christ. Man might have tried to put him down and say, you're not this, you're not that, you're not qualified, but he knew who he was. He was what I would call a giant of the faith and someone who was forgotten to history. But, uh, you know, we're going to talk more about people like him in days to come. Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, small snippet and talking about this great giant of the faith. I hope that you will uh, tell your friends about the program. We're going to be delving into some other great figures uh, of the faith in history, and we're going to learn about them. Uh, hopefully, it'll add to your life. It'll add to your walk in Christ, it'll add to your your journey. You know, we uh, we think in this uh, microwave society that everything comes fast, but it's a life work. We have to depend upon a life work that we're doing for Christ. So let your light shine and let your life 
work. Be dedicated to it. If you know that you know that you know, you can dedicate yourself to it. If you know that you know that God is calling you to that and that you can, you might not even see the fruit of your labor. You might not even see the, the, uh, the results that you're looking for during your lifetime. But know that you know that down the line, when you leave this earth, that your life counted for something because your works will not, your, your works go before you and you know that God is working through you. You know he's, you might not see the result. You might not see the fulfillment of prophecy in your own lifetime, but if you know that God has called you to the work, then you can stick to it and you can have a zeal about it all through your life. So let these Christian authors and let these Christian theologians speak to you. I'm sure that um, this gentleman Pennington and some of the other ones that we're going to look at did not realize that the scope and the magnitude throughout their life and beyond that they would have to impact us. You can have an impact. You can have an impact. You might think that what you're doing, that, that children's meals that you're serving, the, uh, uh, the daycare that you're run, running, the little uh, 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 Alcoholics Anonymous that you're running right now has little value or you can't see the fruit of it, but be encouraged and walk in zeal and walk in purpose knowing that you know that you know that you know that God is working through you. Huh? I know even through the small venue, don't despise the small beginnings. Don't despise the small niche that God has given you because he can make it grow. He can make it grow into something larger than you could even think that even your descendants and those who come after you and your children and your children's children and your children's children's children will benefit because of the work that you're doing now, because of the work that you're doing in your family, the work that you're doing in your community, the work that you're doing in your home. It counts. It counts. So don't be discouraged and don't be, uh, 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 don't get weary in well-doing because it's going, it counts for something. Come on now, be encouraged, be encouraged. Okay. I'm done about that. Hope you come back for another episode. Tell your friends. Tell your friends about it. And we'll see you next time on the show.